from where I'm coming from. I absolutely love Nuka and I love neurology. I happen to think neurology is one of the most best things you can do with your clothes on, but not everybody shares my enthusiasm for it. Um, and my, the way I always tell people is this. Neurology is not a technique. It is a means of assessing your patients, okay? And what I always tell people when it comes to it, bottom line, I am a Nuka practitioner. I use the Nuka technique as a means of adjustment, but I'm also a chiropractic neurologist. So it means I'm always assessing my patient every single time they come in, neurology, neurologically speaking, functionally speaking. I'm looking at everything that, that, that they're seeing. The thing about neurology, it gives you tools. It gives you tools to assess your patient. It gives you tools to assess the quality of your adjustment. One of the biggest things that I see in upper cervical, I happen to think upper cervical is by far the best way to adjust your patient, but it's not. You need to assess your patient to see whether or not they are fit for being adjusted. Okay? Upper cervical is extremely powerful. It's just as wrong, powerful done wrong as it is done right. Okay? You need to know the difference. I've seen practitioners come into this building during um, homecoming and going on about how wonderful their technique is and everything else and what they're describing, what they're describing from their patient is complete neuroma fatigue and in fact neuroma death. I had, there was one practitioner who came in and uh, was telling the story about his uh, uh, little boy that came in to see him, physically disabled, and um, after he adjusted this kid, his legs were straight out, and after he adjusted them, they came down. And both he and the mother were crying, and they're going about, wow, this is so amazing, cut back to blocks, and all of us in the room go, wow, that's incredible. And he told the story then later about how the mother, he told, told it very, much better than I'm telling it now. And he tells the story about how then the mother calls up one day and says, by the way, little Billy died. He won't be coming in today. And the way he said it, you know, there wasn't a dry in the house. It was amazing. But when I was studying, actually, for my neuro board exams, that story came back to me, and I realized something. You have somebody with upper motor neuron lesion. What's one of the hallmarks of an upper motor neuron lesion? Spasticity. So what happens if you're an upper motor neuron lesion and somebody has spasticity that suddenly goes to flaccidity? That is not good. That is neuronal death. Okay? We do not mess around with the atlas. And one of the things that I've seen too, and I do not mean this again, I do not mean this as a slight. I'm giving you my opinion and I'm trying to stir things up here quite frankly. I've seen practitioners too many who don't even know the atlas is. Okay? It's so all I adjust and sometimes I'm wrong. That's why I need extras. And you know the other thing I see as well? 50% of the patients that walk into my office have an actual client. Okay? Automatic red flag for adjusting that. Now for NUCA, not a problem. For most of your uh, upper cervical techniques, not an issue. But for somebody who's doing to diversify to the atlas, bad idea. Okay? You have to know what you're dealing with. You have to be able to visualize what the atlas is. Some people, it's in a very different place than you think it is. And you cannot, in my view, you cannot palpate it. You need to see it on a rated graph and know exactly where it is. So, my two cents. Thought I'd do, the um, biggest thing that I've seen in my practice is trigeminal neuralgia, okay? By no small feat, I get a lot of trigeminal neuralgia patients. I get MMS, um, and I get a lot of vestibular pathologies. So a lot of people with dizziness, a lot of people with unsteadiness, malgebar moss syndrome, peripheral uh, vestibular pathology, central, you name it. A lot of concussion too, more and more concussion. You will find, as you study, the more you study, you will actually start attracting the patients in that you're studying. Like I started doing the, the TBI, uh, Traumatic Brain Injury Program, the postdoc that Ted Carrick is teaching. And since I started it, all of a sudden, I finish a class and the next morning all of a sudden I've got three patients with TBI. <laughs> it's just, it's one of those freaky things. The more you study something, all of a sudden you're going to have sex on the <clears throat> So it's, there is a need for what we do. At the same token, one of the biggest things that I always tell people, it's about neuronal fatigue. You do not ever want to exceed neuronal fatigue or metabolic fatigue rates on a patient. Like that little boy where he had neuronal death, that's what ends up happening. Okay, you can kill brain cells. You have to be able to assess your patient and know when to stop, when to back off, and when not to adjust. That is the beauty of upper cervical is because we don't always adjust. And we assess the patient first, pre and post, so we can see the distinction. But I think...
is because the adjustment takes a few minutes, um, you can assess the patient as you go. So I use a pulse ox, pulse oximeter. I keep it on the entire time I'm adjusting somebody. And I keep a very close eye on their metabolics. It gives you real-time information about how your patient's doing. So if you feel they've had too much input, you can stop, you can pull back, or you can even rest. You can stop for 30 seconds. And that's often what I'm doing. I keep a real close eye on the pulse ox, and I might stop for 10, 15 seconds to see how the patient responds. So the neurology gives you information about the state of your patient and how both before and after and whether or not they're improving. Okay? Priority number one. That's what it's about. You want to make sure they leave your practice in a better state than when they came in. Okay? Talk to Carrick. I went and um, worked with him for a week, uh, a couple months ago, and he's very conservative in his approach. He'll say to a patient, we've got, we've got three out outcomes here. One, I'll make you better. Two, I'll make you worse. Three, no change. He said, well, no. He always says, well, no, within a day or two with which way it is and whether or not to keep proceeding. He's so conservative, that's how he responds. Metabolic fatigue. Um, you want to make sure that you're not overcorrecting your patient. That's really key. For example, first time I would ever had a nuke adjustment, afterwards I was really shaky and I stood on the, the bilateral scales. And my chiropractor said to me, he said, Yeah, you see how you're shaking like that or how you're moving back and forth? That's a sign of your body readjusting. No, it's not. <laughs> That's a sign that I was overcorrected. Your, if somebody's balance is worse following an adjustment, they receive too much. Patient who throws up after adjustment, patient who blows chunks after you adjust them, you just crop their brain out. That is not normal. I don't care what the old timers say, that it's releasing of toxins, that it is retracing, it is a load of crap. Your patient throws up afterwards, you tank the heck out of the brain, okay? Unless they're suffering from food poisoning, <laughs> um, or they've got the stomach flu, they should not be throwing up after an adjustment. That's a sign their vagus system just went to the crap. What about like coughing? Coughing, that's fine. I cough when I tell patients. <laughs> so, no, that's absolutely fine. <coughs> what you want to look at, there are different things that we look at. It's rare, but it can happen. And we often say in UCA that people take three weeks, or three weeks, so like three days recovery, they might feel like they've been hit by a lorry. Excuse me, track, I forget which country I'm in here. Um, <laughs> track or train, you might feel like they've just been flat out. That's not necessarily the best thing. I mean, it's one thing if people are sore everywhere, but it's another thing if they, you know, if they get a fever, if they crash out, if, you know, they get, it's not necessarily the best thing. Somebody's dizzy after or they're throwing up after, those are not good signs. It depends on what kind of dizziness we're talking about. Yeah. If it's lightheaded because you've been down, on, you've been on your side for 15 minutes, uh -huh. that's different, okay? You know, so people's blood pressure will drop, they might get a little bit of orthostatic hypertension when they stand up. That's a little different. If you're talking to someone who spins uh -huh. or wants to pass out, that's not good. Uh -huh. Okay, so there's a distinction with that. Uh -huh. The thing with muca, well, not just muca, with other upper cervical, we're using a biomechanical approach to fix a neurological problem. Okay? You have the insult there, you have to have the symmetry. So let me draw this out. To intermediate in place of medulla. This is parahypoglossal, which means it is it is caudal in the medulla. It is next to the hypoglossal nucleus. And what it does, it's like a big switchboard basically of information coming from the upper cervical spine. So from the um, from the muscle spindles, from the mechanoreceptors, all this feeds the INM. Okay? So it's the intermediate nucleus. And collects all this information about head and neck and posture. And the thing about this is, any of the research they've done, this is completely separate from the vestibular system, which is pretty impressive. So, because they've done these studies with, with cadavers, and they found that the vestibular system, even with that out, the intermediate nucleus was still fine. So, this is why it's so cool about this work. So, the intermediate nucleus of the medulla then feeds to. Sorry. Nucleus tractus solitarius. This is the most important nucleus when it comes to adjusting, okay? This is basically the, the motor or the head, if you like, of the parasympathetics, okay? This cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11. The nucleus tractus solitaris feeds all those three. 
So, big stuff. Okay. That's the sensory branch. That then feeds the motor branch. of vagus, dorsal motor nucleus of vagus. Vagus is your big kahuna, okay? Heart rate, heart function, heart, heart rate, heart rhythm, lung function, gut function. Vagus goes all the way to the ascended colon. It feeds to the liver, to the lungs, to the intestines, to the heart, and everything in between. So it is a huge amount of thing. So all of a sudden, you can see something here. You've got upper cervical symmetry. Symmetry. Sorry, I live in London, so sometimes I say cervical versus cervical. <laughs> that means cervix in the UK. So that's why I say I mix them up sometimes. Um, all of a sudden, you have biomechanics, biomechanical symmetry, and upper cervical spine determining heart, lung, kidney and uh, bowel. All of a sudden, all this information is affecting your autonomics. That's the power of what we do. Sod, neck pain, and back pain. That's a nice little side effect that we get when we adjust somebody. But we can help with that. Where this power and this work comes from is how it affects autonomics. That's the key to what we do. That's why chiropractic continued to, to flourish. It didn't die and continued to flourish, so the war joined the um, swine flu epidemic in 1918. This was why, because it changes autonomics, it changes the immune system, and it changes brain function. Okay. That's what it comes down to, full stop. Any questions? The, but the, the goal is the same. We're looking at getting head on straight with all upper cervical symptoms, systems. We're looking to get the head on straight and get the atlas as level as we can get, right? So, symmetry of the upper cervical spine. That information from the head and neck translates into the intermediate nucleus of the medulla. Intermediate nucleus of the medulla is a big switchboard of all the information from the head and neck telling it where it is in space. So if you look at it from an um, evolutionary point of view, it's so you can coordinate your autonomics to your eyes and your ears. Okay? Because it's all head and neck posture is all about the eyes and ears. Because if you look at it from an evolutionary point of view, when we were Neanderthals, or we were, you know, cave dwellers, and you get that saber-toothed tiger creeping up behind you, you have to be able to see it, pop, get your sympathetics kicked in high gear, and run. Right? Same thing if you're tracking prey, you have to be able to see it and go after it. It was about survival. Okay? So you can see why these mechanisms actually developed in the first place. It was about running away if you were prey or you were chasing prey. That's why the eyes are so key. My patients come in like, I have low back pain, why are you looking at my eyes? Because it tells me a lot about one, the health, one's health and the state of one's brain. So, intermediate nucleus in the medulla feeds all the information about head and neck posture to the nucleus tractus solitarius. Nucleus tractus solitarius, the biggest nucleus by far when it comes to adjusting. It is the mother load for cranial nerves 9, 10, 11. So it is the thing, the nucleus for parasympathetics. Everybody, sympathetics up here, parasympathetics down here. You want to get an even balance by stimulating this. Okay? The biggest thing with this is for is the sensory branch. They're afferent branch of the vagus. Cranial nerve 10. Okay? Efferent branch or the motor branch is dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. Okay? That then feeds the organs. And then the organs then feed their information back to the NTS. So you've got the afferent and then the efferent. The spinal column. So, vestibular nuclei. This feeds up, this goes cephalad through the medial longitudinal fasciculus. When it comes to MS, this is often the area that's hit. Mean longitudinal fasciculus is highly, highly um, um, myelinated, and in fact, it's the first area in the CNS that myelinates. Technically, I suppose it's not oligodendrocytes as opposed to myelin, technically, in CNS. So, 
it's the first thing that is myelinated. So it tends to be something that is, is affected in MS. Why you get internucleophthalmoplegia, where you get the one and a half syndrome, where people can't converge their eyes. That's how you can tell from MS. So this is the kind of thing that gets affected by that. Then you have cranial nerves three, four, and six, which dictate eyes, exactly. Now, I also add 12 to this. Anybody know why? Exactly, homologous columns, well done. So, in the brainstem, you've got, obviously, you, we've got 12 cranial nerves. One and two technically aren't even part of the brainstem, okay? One and two technically aren't even cranial, aren't even nerves, but that's another lecture. So, three down are all the cranial nerves. Three, four, and six, and 12 are all central. They're all central nuclei. Five, seven, nine, 10, 11, and 12, or excuse me, five, seven, nine, 10, 11, are all lateral. So you have a homologous column. And anybody know what a homologous column is? I already know the answer to this, so. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Basically, yeah, you have neuronal pools that when one group of neuronal pools is, is stimulated, the neuronal pools next to it or in line with it will get stimulated. And it usually works in a cephalagicotid direction. So what ends up happening? Three, four, and six are stimulated, and that information will start feeling down to the to the top. So all four, I add all four in that. So that feeds any information from here, the longitudinal fasciculus, and then that will then feed down to the door to the descending medial longitudinal fasciculus, also known as the vestibular spinal tract. Okay. Everybody clear so far? So showing here, we've got the eyes and the tongue, how they feed into the pons, the vestibular nuclei, and then that feeds down to the erector spinae. Okay. I.e. muscle tongue. So you can see very clearly if someone's hypotonic in their spine, where it comes from, it can be brain-based, right? This is involuntary. You can't change that. The multifidus, for example, you cannot physically exercise that muscle. You need to set it up on a label of foundation. The reason why? Because you need to send the information up so you can cause in increased activation down. So far, so good? Okay. So you've got four things that feed into the vestibular nuclei. You want to see three nerve roots. TMJ. already how adjusting the atlas will fit into this picture here and why we assess, for example, the atlas. So you've got atlas here, and then atlas will obviously affect here through the spino, uh, spinocerebellar tracts. Mm -hmm. This then feeds out again to the NTS. This is why I assess eyes. This is why in neurology, eyes are the window to the soul, but why they are so key to the health of one's nervous system, because it tells you so much about the state of one's brain. Okay? One of the biggest things that'll tell you something, for example, is I do pursuits and saccades. You can see very clearly if somebody's pursuits are off, whether or not what's going on with the brain. If eyes aren't tracking properly, how can you survive? I mean, you do physically, obviously, but from an evolutionary perspective, if you can't track, 
If you're tracking prey, how are you going to eat if you can't track that prey and go after it and kill it and eat? You won't survive. So you have to look at it from those perspectives. Everything developed from an evolutionary point of view. Nuclei, and then you've got two outcomes. You've got the NTS and the dorsal and motor nucleus of vagus. Again. So you can see how they're all intertwined. But still, how the intermediate nucleus of medulla is still separate from this. But yet, it still feeds into the same areas. So that's why you can have an issue with the atlas. You can have an issue with the vestibular system. You can have an issue with this. You can have an issue with the atlas, the TMJ, with the inner ear, all causing dizziness, for example. Then you have to figure out where is it coming from. Now, the fact remains is pretty much every dizziness, as dizzy patient that comes in, I'm going to adjust by using your gut. Okay. Just, it's the nature of what it is. It is the tool in my book, Toolbox. But I'm still going to assess and see if they need more. A lot of people need gaze stabilization. A lot of people need gaze stabilization exercises. If you can't hold gaze, that's a problem. If you cannot hold gaze while you're moving head, your head in different directions, there's a problem. Way too much, way, way, way too much movement to your head. Yeah, that's gonna make you dizzy. Should make you dizzy. Yeah. 